Okay. Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm uh, Tony LeBlanc, and today I'm in conversation with Captain Mike Bannister, Chief Pilot of BA's Concord Fleet. Mike has Hi, recently... Tony. Mike, hello, Mike. Mike has recently published a book on his career with British Airways and his experience with Concord. Not surprisingly, the book is called Concord, and it's a really good read. I really enjoyed it, Mike. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you. Um, first of all, let's let's get down to the nitty gritty about how you got into aviation, and it was all about a young fellow on the beach at Bournemouth, wasn't it? Yeah, I. Uh... We used to live in southern Bedfordshire. We didn't have a car, and it's in the days before motorways. And we always used to go down to the south coast near Bournemouth for our holidays each year. But each year, it would take a five-and-a-half-hour coach journey to get there, and I hate coach journeys to this day. So I can remember at the age of seven, wandering across the beach in Bournemouth and looking up, seeing this little aeroplane flying over on its way to France or the Channel Islands. And with the precociousness of a seven-year-old, I worked out that my five and a half hour coach journey would just take 20 minutes in that aeroplane. So that was it. I was sold. <laughs> Took my bucket and spade back up the beach and told mum and dad I wanted to be a pilot. And that was it. That was uh, it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and of course, it's it's an ambition that you were able to sort of continue throughout your working life. Because um, was it age 16 or 18 that you had the choice of either the RAF or handball? Yeah, I wanted to be a pilot, and so I pursued both that, both avenues, both the military and the civil, and applied to the RAF and applied to Hamble, which at the time was the, the college for civil aviation pilots. I got a first acceptance from the RAF, so there I was, all lined up to join the RAF and set to go, even with a travel warrant in my hand to go off up to Cranwell, when my father was sadly taken very ill. Um, and I told the RAF that, and they were very good. They said, look, dear boy, we fully understand. Uh, we'll put you on the next course, which happened to be March. Yeah. Fortunately, my father survived, and later in that year, in November, I got a phone call from Hamble saying, a person's just dropped off a course starting this Friday. Do you want the place? I said, well, I have to think about it. They said, you've got an hour. <laughs> so after about 20 minutes, I phoned them back and said, yes, please, and that was it. So my career was in civil aviation rather than military. So you, you get underway and you get a, a, a civil um, aviation pilot's license. How long did the training take? In those days, it was 18 months, 18 months residential in Hamble, just outside Southampton. Uh, and you didn't get much time off just Easter and, and Christmas. And it was all, all very intensive. The first chunk was pure classroom that lasted about six or seven weeks. Then there was an intermediate chunk where you did some classroom and flying. And then the final section was just flying. And at the end of it, you came out with a commercial pilot's license and an instrument rating. And you were offered the opportunity to state a preference for which of the two sponsoring airlines you'd like to join, be it BEA or BOAC, both forerunners of British Airways. Um, it was co corresponded with a downturn in the business. So neither BOAC nor BEA wanted pilots at the time. Well, the way they resolved that was just to say to all those that graduated on the course, well, you can go whichever one you want to. So we were the only course that ever graduated from Hamble where all of us got our first choice. So of the 30 that graduated out of the 45 that joined, which shows you the failure yeah. rate, yeah. of the 30 that graduated, 12 went to BEA and 18, including myself, went to BOAC. And of course, one of the first planes that you actually flew as a qualified pilot was the VC-10. Yeah, which, indeed. Uh, I as a lad, that was the one that um, was just came into service. 1964 was the first flight, and it was a beautiful airplane. I always wanted to fly it. Uh, and as my career progressed, Concord came along, and I got that in my checkbox as well, that that's something I'd like to do. But it wasn't in service uh, when I was going through Hamble. I was in Hamble 1967. Uh, and so it was the VC-10, and I had a really, really good time. It was a fabulous airplane. And uh, life goes round in circles. And I'm now vice uh, chair of trustees at Brooklyn's Museum. And yeah. Brooklyn's is where the, the VC-10 was designed and built and first flew from. So uh, there's a lot of circular paths in my career. And, and there's a story that apparently the Brooklyn's runway was so short that you you know you'd have to take it off from the manufacturing base to Wisley to fit it out. Was that correct? That has, that was correct. Uh, the other thing that was a bit of a trick was later on. I wasn't involved in any of this, but later on when they wanted to fit automatic landing systems to the airplane, they had to be flown back in 
Uh, and that was quite difficult, I understand. It is a very short runway. Mm. And the last VC-10 to fly in there um, flew in there and is now uh, an, exhi an exhibit at Brooklands. So you can get a VC-10 in there, or you could, uh, but it was a very short runway and, and took quite a lot of concentration. It's an incredible story, isn't it? And as an aeroplane, it, it held the transatlantic subsonic record, didn't it, for a while? It did for quite a long time. It was a quick aeroplane, very streamlined, very powerful. Uh, like many British aircraft, you could say it was over-engineered. It, it had more than it needed, which made it a great competitor for the 707. Uh, and that's the main reason it was built, of course, that it was for hot and high airfields in Africa, where the Boeing 707 couldn't really compete. Uh, so rather than make a different aeroplane, what they did was lengthen the runways. So that's how the 707 managed to compete with the VC-10 in the end. Yeah, but it was the last major airliner built in the U solely built in the UK, yeah? Yeah, the last large airliner, the BA-146, of course, was built in the UK. That yeah. was a short-haul aircraft, but it was the last intercontinental airline totally built in the UK. But, of course, at, at Brooklands, which is to this day the biggest aircraft manufacturing facility in Europe, there's been over 18,600 aircraft built there. 30% of each Concorde that was ever built, whether it had British Airways or Air France on the tail, uh, was built at Brooklyn. So there's a lot of aviation manufacturing still going on at Brooklyn's well into the late 80s. Let's get on to the Concorde project, because essentially it was an Anglo-French partnership. And I suppose you could say it was the birth of Airbus up to a point. It was to a large point because a lot of the facilities that were and processes that were developed to produce Concorde went on to be the bedrock of Airbus. And even some components that were on the Concorde and some of the systems uh, found their way into the early Airbus aircraft, particularly the A300. Not the supersonic parts, but more of the systems parts, particularly yeah. in the hydraulic system. Uh, and the, as the infrastructure, the mechanisms and the methods that went into the uh, formation of Airbus were initially founded and designed and built and implemented for the production of Concorde. So when Concorde comes out as a concept, a lot of airlines are very, very interested in it. And then suddenly there's an oil crisis and you then just end up with two players, which were what I suppose still BOAC then, was it? Yeah, of course, what happened France. was when Concorde came along, it was the new gee whiz supersonic airliner. It would get you there in less than half the time. And lots of airlines were interested. Uh, the order book had over 230 orders and options in it at one stage. But as you rightly say, along came a fuel crisis. And the airlines have to decide what are they going to do? Are they going to fly this supersonic airliner that can carry 100 passengers or this also relatively new airliner, the Boeing 747 jumbo jet, that can carry up to 400 passengers? Yeah. Well, ironically, Concorde would make the airline more money flying full across the Atlantic than the 747 would. But uh, they think ahead in the airlines, quite rightly. If you can carry 400 passengers, you're building a customer base for the future. So all of the airlines said, right, we don't want Concorde. We'll go for something else. And when I say all, I do mean all, including BOAC and Air France. But of course, at that stage, both BOAC and Air France were owned by their respective governments, their respective taxpayers, who who had also signed a treaty for the production of the aeroplane. So they were heavily embedded into the whole project. They instructed their airlines, that BOAC and Air France, that they would operate the aeroplane. The airlines, yeah. of course, said, we don't want to, we'll lose money. So the governments uh, underwrote any initial losses and they underwrote the development and they underwrote um, all of the infrastructure, the, the fixed infrastructure needed to support the aircraft. In exchange for that, the UK government said to BOAC, right, if you make a profit, uh, then we want 80 pence in the pound. A corporation tax at the time was 50%, so that's another 10 pence in the pound gone. So really, there was little incentive for the airlines to make money in the early stages of the operation. Uh, BOAC did, because of the novelty po uh, part of the aircraft, but it wasn't long after that that they went back to the government to rearrange a new arrangement. And was it jealousy or just being um, pig-headed that made the US regulators get ultra involved in terms of saying we don't want the plane to come over the US? Uh, you could tick both those boxes. You could tick uh, NIMBY, not invented here. Uh, you could tick pride. You can tick nationalism. You can tick all sorts of things. The reality was... But at the time, there were three great projects to build supersonic airliners, Concorde, uh, the Americans with the Boeing 2707, and the Russians with the TU-144. 
the 2707 never went beyond uh, a, a wooden mock-up stage, but they spent more money getting to that stage than the British and the French spent getting an airplane in the air. Uh, and the Russians did produce a supersonic airliner, but they just didn't have the knowledge and the technologies to make it as, as efficient as Concord. It flew, but it was never a commercial success. And so when the 2707, the American Concord uh, equivalent, was scrapped by President Nixon, there was a lot of, well, it wasn't invented in America, therefore we don't want yeah. it. As our project hasn't worked, so we're not going to support somebody else's. Fortunately, the commercial side of uh, the American economy and society said, well, hang on a minute, just because it wasn't made here doesn't mean it's not of value to us. Uh, and eventually common sense won through. And ironically, when Concord eventually ceased operations and we look back over the years, more than 50 percent of our customers were U.S. originating. Mm, that's, that's interesting. Now, the opportunity um, crops up for you to bid. <laughs> Um, for a role with Concord. So, you know, obviously that was something you couldn't, you know, uh, you couldn't ignore, could you, as 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 a chance? Well, it was something I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, on, when I was at Hamble, I watched the first ever flight of the British Assembled Concord on April the 9th, 1969, from a, a study room uh, at the college where I was studying for my final exams. It was a black and white TV in the corner and I watched Concord take off and, listen to Raymond Baxter's commentary and I thought as a 17 year old then that's what I want to do I want to fly Concorde yeah. and as you rightly say when the opportunity came up I put my name forward and there were lots and lots of people who wanted to fly Concorde not every pilot because for various reasons it doesn't suit everybody's lifestyle but there were far 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 more people who wanted to fly the airplane than there were positions on the course so you had to have a, a combination of what was described as above average technical skills, whatever that might mean, um, be in the right place at the right time with yeah. the right seniority. Uh, and fortunately, I succeeded in all of those things coming together and went on to the Concorde fleet in 1977 as a co-pilot. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that. That was fantastic. And, and you trained at Bryce Norton because, I mean, you don't, don't just get into a Concorde and start it up and fly off, do you? There's a, there's a lot of pretty intensive uh, training in something like that. Yeah, even for the most experienced pilots and those that came across onto Concorde uh, were very experienced. So the captains would probably have 25 years with British Airways. I, as a co-pilot, had eight years. Many others had 10. So we're experienced pilots. But when you move from one airplane to another airplane, you don't just get in and turn it on and go. Mm. You have to have a course that teaches you how that particular aircraft flies, how to operate it, all the various systems, what to do when things go wrong. And then you just fly that particular type of airplane. Uh, and that course normally would take around two months from the beginning to the end before you're fully qualified to fly that particular aircraft, like a 747 yeah. or a, an Airbus. Concorde, it was so complex that it wasn't two months, it was six months. And of those six months, four months of those were residential in Bristol, uh, two months chalk and talk, learning the systems, two months flying the simulator. And it wasn't until the last two months you actually got in an aeroplane, in my case at Brian's Norton, and flew it for the first time, and then subsequently two months further training uh, under supervision with passengers on board. And, and of course, the setup was different to what it is these days, where you've just got two people basically in the cockpit. In those days, two pilots and a flight engineer. And the flight engineer had quite a bit of input into the whole thing, didn't he? Oh, the flight engineer was absolutely crucial. Um, the flight engineer's primary role... Um, is managing all the systems on the airplane. Yeah. And because Concorde was effectively four airplanes in one, a high airplane, a low airplane, a fast airplane, and a slow airplane, there were a lot more systems for the flight engineer to manage. Uh, and that's what he did. And he was constantly looking after all those systems, using them for everything, including trimming and balancing the airplane. But he had a very important other role in making sure that he's monitoring what the two pilots are doing. Not yeah. a qualified pilot per se. Um, they had to be a qualified engineer. It was the first time and the only time that a civil aeroplane had a qualification requirement that the person at that panel must be a qualified engineer. Um, many of them were pilots just out of interest and, and they got private pilot's licenses. But they, their, their other role was to make sure that the, the two pilots that operated the airplane were doing the right thing at the right time. So it was a fully integrated team effort to operate the airplane. Uh, and the flight engineer was an essential and equal part of that team. 
I mean, I guess the flight engineer these days has been replaced by the fact that planes are computerized and uh, fly by wire and everything else. That's, that's absolutely made the difference. Yeah. And we, we looked at doing that with Concord in the mid 90s when computers were more sophisticated than the 20 years previously when Concord was introduced. Uh, screens were available. You could put all of your systems up on a screen. It worked very well. So we actually looked at doing that for Concord and decided not to for a number of reasons. Firstly, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm. Uh, the systems work very well. But secondly, although the actual cost of the kit to do all that was relatively cheap and uh, uh, attainable, the major cost would have been taking an airplane out of scheduled service for up to a year to recertificate the airplane. Well, if you've got an airplane where uh, our customers are prepared to pay thousand five thousand pound per ticket, there's a hundred seats, two flights a day. You don't have to be a, a genius to work out that if you take one of those airplanes out for a year, the loss of revenue is massive. Mm. And so that's why we decided not to do it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And really, it just didn't make financial sense. And there were only seven in the BA fleet in any case, weren't there? There were seven operational airplanes. Yeah. Um, BA actually owned an eighth airplane. Because in 1984, uh, BA did a, a deal with the UK government that superseded the previous one. So the previous one basically underwrote any losses, but also took 80%, 90%, including corporation tax, the profits. There's no incentive to make any profit. So BA renegoti BA renegotiated with the then Thatcher government to say, look, if we stand all of the operating costs, and the cost of the infrastructure, like the factories, the plant, the people to support the aeroplane, um, then, you know, we will stand any losses, but we will keep any profits. It wasn't quite that simple, but fundamentally, mm. from 1984 onwards, that was the mechanism that came into place for BA. And that was the trigger to enthuse BA to do everything they could to make Concorde profitable. And they did, and it was exceedingly profitable for British Airways through the period of operation. Many people think it wasn't, but it was. So there you are, age 28, the youngest person on on board in terms of uh, having the flying qualification. What did that feel like? Kind of um, amazing. You, you, you sort of do these things in salami slices. So you, you know that you're on the conversion course. You know that you're going to Bristol. You know you're going to do the technicals. You know you're going to do the simulator. You know you're going to fly the aeroplane under supervision and then you know you're going to go on to fly the airplane with passengers on board it's little incremental slices and it's not until you look back at the whole thing and think good grief you know there i am 28 um i'm still not 100 percent confident in driving my car all the time <laughs> and there they are british airways are letting me fly this supersonic airliner yeah, uh yeah. it was fabulous and and the first flight i ever did which was a training flight was absolutely amazing it, it it inculcated into me why the crews on Concord called her the rocket, because we sat at the end of the runway. I listened to the training captain. He said, I opened up throttles to full power and level off ahead at 2,500 feet, if you can. I thought, what do you mean, if I can? You know, I'm a fully <laughs> qualified pilot. Well, of course, Concord was taking off with its full power, all four engines at max power with reheat, which is the power it needs if it weighs 185 tonnes. Well, on this day, it only weighed 120 tonnes, but we still use full power. And when you put the throttles open, you are literally pushed back into your seat. Next thing I knew, I was at 4,000 feet and looked across at the training captain, who's got the biggest smile, and said, don't worry, we all do it, Mike. And, yeah, and when yeah, I became a training yeah, captain, yeah, I did yeah. the same thing with my trainees, <laughs> and they all did it. So, uh, And, of course, it, it did. It, am I right in saying it sort of did this stepped takeoff to cut down the noise? Yeah, well, kind of, not 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 so much a step takeoff, but, but the procedure for the whole of the takeoff segment, if you like. Yeah. So we would use full power and reheat for every takeoff because yeah. even if you were relatively lightweight, the thinking was it's better to use full power, get up, get away, leave the noise behind. But on the other hand, we recognize that uh, the reheats in particular, but the engines were noisy. And so we would calculate exactly on the day the very best time to reduce the power to reduce the noise to have the least impact on the surrounding environment and depending on the airport you're at uh, that procedure would be different for each airport and for each runway and and, and so for, so from that point of view you take it leisurely down the m4 from heathrow and then open her up a bit 
Yeah, you'd you'd take off after about one minute and ten seconds. You'd um, switch the reheats off, reduce the power, and then as you got higher and got faster, you would increase your rate of climb. As you climbed up and got further away, you'd put more power back on until it wasn't until 8,000 feet when you got full power on, no reheats anymore, but full power, and then you'd climb up to 28,000 feet over the West Country, cruise at 95% of the speed of sound because we weren't allowed to exceed the speed of sound over land until you got over the Bristol Channel, southeast of Swansea. That's when you could put the power back on, yeah, put the reheats back on and take it through the sand barrier. Yeah, yeah. Incredible, and and of course the thing expanded and contracted, didn't it? Uh, there's this lovely photograph in the, your book of this uh, trapped peak cap between two segments. And yeah, well, because the airplane travelled so quickly, faster than the Earth rotates, faster than the rifle bullet on the edge of space where the sky got darker, you could see the curvature of the Earth, twenty three miles a minute, a mile every two and three quarter seconds, literally twice the speed of sound. But it would heat up, and it heated up because of the friction of the air going over the surface and the compression of the air, because the air just can't get out of the way. Yeah. So you're compressing the air all the time, and if you compress it, it heats. So the airplane would heat up. The temperature on the nose would get up to 200-plus um, degrees Fahrenheit, 127 degrees Celsius. The temperature on the wings would be around the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius. So consequently, if you heat something up, to those sort of temperatures for up to three hours, because Concord could fly at twice the speed of sound for more than three hours, it will grow in size, it will expand. Now, fortunately, the designers knew that, and they made accommodation for it across the entire airplane, because the airplane would stretch between six and 10 inches in flight. Uh, the only place you could see this stretching was on the flight deck, mm. uh, between the flight engineer's panel, which was sideways on, and the bulkhead behind it. Now, on the ground, I couldn't get my fingertips into the gap between his panel and the bulkhead. But in the air, when you'd been at Mach 2 for up to three hours, that a gap would open up. You'd get your whole hand in there easily. <laughs> and so incredible. what we did on the very last flight of each Concorde as we took them off to the various museums around the world, uh, it was also, by definition, the last flight for our flight engineers because there were no more airplanes in the BA fleet that needed flight engineers so we put the flight engineer's cap in that gap at Mach 2, knowing that when we descended, decelerated and cooled, the airplane would shrink again and the cap would be jammed in there for all time or at least until the airplane flew supersonically again as a tribute <laughs> to flight engineers. Incredible, incredible. Um, London to New York, three and a half hours. <clears throat> but the best time apparently was two hours, 53 minutes in 1986. That's incredible, yeah. isn't it? Well, London to New York, the, the, the actual scheduled flight time was about 3.20. But, of course, from New York to London, if there is any wind, it's going to be predominantly westerly behind you. And in those days, um, our knowledge of the jet stream, which we all now know about and the effects that it has on our climate, but the, the knowledge of the jet stream was limited. We were discovering about the jet stream because it's up at the sort of altitudes we fly at. And so as we flew the airplane more and more and got to know more about the jet stream, we could forecast when the jet stream would be lying along our track. So we flew the same track every day because normally the effect of the wind would be minimal unless you've got the jet stream on your track. And so if you know it's going to be on your track or it's forecast to be, the thing you would then do is try and fly into that jet stream yeah. knowing you have a 150 mile an hour tailwind. And those were the days when we attempt to do a fast record. Now, we would operate the airplane perfectly normally, but we would just make sure that we had the benefit of this large tailwind. And you're absolutely right. The, the record time was two hours, 52 minutes and 59 seconds. That's not bad to go from takeoff at New York to landing at London. Bit better than getting from Bedfordshire to Bournemouth. <laughs> well, yeah, about half the time. Well, less than half the time. Yeah. And significantly greater distance. <laughs> As we progress with the story, um, Concord does doesn't exactly get into financial problems, but you need to think of different ways of uh, raising revenue, and this is where Goodwood Travel come into it, and that was an interesting yeah. concept. Yeah, it was after eighty four when it became uh, easier and made more sense to strive for profit for British Airways. Um, yeah. British Airways by this stage was standing on its own legs. If it lost money on Concord, 
British Airways had to fund the loss. If it made money on Concorde, British Airways kept the funds. So there was incentive to make profit. As I mentioned earlier, we did. We made for over £500 million real bottom line profit on Concorde during that period from then through to the end of operations. And that's when £500 million was a lot of money. You could buy oh, yeah. more than two footballers with £500 million in those days. <laughs> um, so one of the ways that we would do that was special flights. So the, if you like, the fixed operating costs of Concorde were borne by the scheduled service that we yeah. knew we were doing. So two flights a day each way to and from New York and other scheduled flights to places like Barbados and Washington and at Singapore on occasions. Um, so the special flights were one-offs with major companies of which Goodwood Travel was the biggest. And um, with those, that because the fundamental cost of the fleet was borne by the scheduled service, most of that money for British Airways was profit. And we took Concorde to over 272 destinations around the world, uh, and 76 of those were in the USA. Uh, and in that period, we carried literally millions of passengers who would otherwise would never have flown on Concorde. Concorde carried two and a half, British Airways Concorde carried two and a half million passengers during its time of service. And a, a large number of those, not the not the, the um, maximum, not the majority, but a large number of those were uh, special flights between uh, Heathrow and places around the world, literally round the bay to round the world. But now our 40 round the bay or 23 days round the world and everything in between. And, yeah. and Concord was greeted wherever we went with an amazing turnout. I can remember taking it to Oklahoma City once and 40,000 people turned up to see the airplane. That's incredible. I mean, we, we took advantage of Goodwood and went to Cairo for lunch. <laughs> and, and back in the same day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, I still boggle at that because our perception of the distance to Cairo and, and all that Cairo embodies in its history and Egypt and, and all that stuff. Can you go there and back and see the 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 pyramids and the sphinx and have lunch come back the same day yeah you could on concord yeah absolutely despite the fact it was going subsonic over europe and didn't actually press the button until we got to the adriatic yeah which goes back to not being allowed to fly supersonic yeah over. yeah yeah but i mean it was a fantastic you know one of the highlights of our lives no doubt about that it was super and um you know welcome on the flight deck in those days yeah we would be delighted to uh, have people visit us on the flight deck pre-9-11. On a scheduled flight, uh, we have 100 seats and our, our scheduled uh, numbers would be on average in high 50s, low 60%. So on a scheduled flight, it would be most unusual if we didn't have 10, 12, 15 people from our scheduled customers wanting to come and see the flight deck during the flight. And these are people who fly regularly. Yeah, yeah. 80% of our, our people were business people and of those 80% were repeat customers, but they still wanted to come and see the flight deck. On the special flights, everybody wanted to come and see the flight deck during flight. And so we would put an extra crew member on to host those uh, visits and to explain the technical side of the airplane. Yeah, it was almost a queue from one end of the aircraft to the other. Yeah. <laughs> but there we are. Now, of course, you know, it came to a rather sad end. And the beginning of the end was Air France AF4590. Um. Having read your book, it does seem to me that, you know, possibly the way the French actually observed that accident wasn't the same as it happened factually. Would that be fair? Well, I think there's 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 a number of elements to it. Firstly, um, I first learned about the, the, the Air France accident when I was going up the gangplank of the QE2 with, with my wife and daughter to get on board her to sail across the Atlantic for a holiday. My page and, page and phone went off at the same time. You must ring British Airways, most urgent. I did, and that was the first I learned of the accident. So the decision was, you know, do we go on on the holiday or do I go back to Heathrow? Well, I went back to Heathrow. And my perception of the process that is followed an aircraft accident is that, is, which is followed by most places in the world. What you do is you find out what caused the accident, uh, and then you go on to try and ensure that you make modifications or changes to uh, the structure or the procedures to ensure that accident can never happen again. And no one person is fundamentally to blame. All accidents are a chain of events yeah. that come yeah. together. Yeah. So if you fall in, fall over in the shower tomorrow morning, it's a simple accident, but there's a chain of events. The water's running, you drop the soap, you don't look where you put your foot. 
it to stop that accident, all you've got to do is take away one of those elements. So the yeah. water's not running, or you don't drop the soap, or you do look where you put your foot. That's my perception of what the accident process is like. It ain't like that in France. Mm. France, based on Napoleonic law, has a to find out and who's to blame and to prosecute that person and, if necessary, to come up with some punishment for what they have done. Yeah. To me, that's totally alien. So that was one element. Uh, and secondly, uh, having got that process, when you are, when they identified one element of the accident, then they focused on that one element and disregarded the contribution made by all the other elements. Mm. And that, to me, was um, not the way to go about things. So I found it a difficult time to try and get over that this accident was a chain of events and that we could rectify it and that there was no single individual uh, or failure point to blame. It was a multiple thing. But, of course, in France, because of their mechanism, the, the trial was a criminal trial. Yeah. And people were being criminally prosecuted. And, indeed, in the first trial, one person was found criminally guilty, sentenced to 15 months in prison and a big fine. Um, we appealed, and during the appeal, we brought forward more evidence uh, and demonstrated that not all of the things that had been taken for granted in the first trial were necessarily the whole story, and everyone was found not guilty in the, the retrial, uh, apart from one individual who sub, sub, well, had very sadly died in the intervening period. That was a very difficult time in my life because, on the one hand, it was a fabulous aeroplane and a big part of my life, and I thought she was marvellous. On the other hand, I had to try and find a way to describe how there could be failings in the system which led to the accident without blaming the crew and without blaming yeah. the airplane. There's no one individual's to blame. But but from what I can see, um, part of the problem was the fact that that spacer which separates the wheels on the undercarriage was missing. And there was a theory also, Mike, that the plane was on fire before it hit that piece of debris from the Continental Airlines um, uh, plane that was in front of it. Uh, yeah. What do you I, say I about mean, that? It, well, that, I cover all this stuff in some detail in the book yeah. because there, you're right, there was a spacer missing. Um, the spacer uh, is designed to keep the wheels the right distance apart and hold them steady relative to each other. If that spacer is missing, then the undercarriage can operate rather like a supermarket trolley and wibble wobble. That spacer was missing, but the court decided that it had no effect on the accident. Um, but there were also, there were uh, eyewitnesses who s swore, literally swore, because yeah. they had to uh, do it legally, that they saw the airplane on fire before it encountered the piece of metal on the runway, which had been uh, pinpointed by the judicial process as being the key, a key element in the accident. The way the judicial process saw it was that the piece of metal uh, scalped the tire, took the tread off, large element of rubber flew up, hit the underside of the airplane, caused an, an, an internal um, uh, compression of the fuel inside the fuel tank, which burst the tank open, out came the fuel, and that ignited. Now, the way that that process happened could be pinpointed to a particular place on the runway because there were scold marks and debris. Yeah. There were a number of eyewitnesses who say they saw the airplane on fire before it reached that point. Now, those eyewitnesses' testimonies were to a large uh, extent discounted yeah. because the, the argument in the court case was that eyewitness reports are notoriously unreliable, which is actually true. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you or I or anyone listening to the, this pro program goes out and suddenly there's a car accident. You look up, you're startled, you weren't expecting it. You, you, you know what you've seen, or at least you think you know what you've seen, and the brain puts together all the elements to form a picture. Now, those yeah. eyewitness accounts can be very unreliable because you're startled, you weren't expecting it. The, the people that saw or testified that they saw Concord on fire before it reached the piece of metal were A, aviation professionals, B, they had seen Concorde take off before many times. C, they had made a conscious effort to watch the aeroplane before anything happened. And D, they were familiar with their surroundings. And so they could pinpoint where they first thought they saw the aeroplane on fire. Now, another element of discarding that testimony was that um, eyewitness A said, I saw the aeroplane on fire here. Eyewitness B, there. Eyewitness C, there. 
So their testimonies were initially discarded. What we did was to build a 3D model of the entire airport, the runway, overlay it with all the geographical and um, transponder and radar information we had, and demonstrate that Eyewitness A saw it here because that's the first time Eyewitness A could see it yeah. because there was something else in the way that stopped Eyewitness B from seeing it until the airplane was there. And Eyewitness C could not see it because there was something else in the way until the airplane got to there. So actually, they did all tie together. And it was a, a very strong case that there is certainly was certainly worth pursuing further as to whether the airplane was on fire before it reached a piece of metal. We're, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but essentially BA came up with some remedials in terms of fuel tanks, new tyres, etc. But eventually, unfortunately, the, the, the project was abandoned. And uh, you were there on the last one in to Heathrow, flying the flag, good photograph in the book. And that was it, apart from the fact that most of them, well, all of them are in preservation, aren't they? Well, you say that was it. I mean, we, in BA, we were determined that the retirement of Concord would be a, a celebration, not a wake. Yeah. yeah. Um, I vehemently inside the company argued that we shouldn't retire the airplane, but my argument didn't carry the day. So I'm then faced with the choice. What do I do? Do I throw my toys out of the pram and sulk off or do I accept collective responsibility and get on with it? Mm. I chose answer B and was put in charge of the retirement program and absolutely determined it was going to be a celebration of 27 years of successful supersonic operations like British Airways carrying two and a half million passengers at twice the speed of sound, something that hasn't been done since and something that was a very strong British project in combination with our French colleagues that no other nation in the world could do that hasn't been done for another 20 years. No. That is something to celebrate, and I was determined that we would celebrate it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was good. Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much. And everybody listening, watching, I really commend Mike's book. It's very, very interesting. It's not all techie stuff. And, um, you know, it's incredible how that little boy on Bournemouth ended up as chief pilot of BA Concorde. Great to well, Thank you very to you. much indeed. I'm, I'm delighted you, uh, you enjoyed the book and I hope that your listeners will look forward to reading it. Take care, Mike. Thank you so much. Will do. Take care. Bye-bye.